All right, let's get started. So welcome everyone to our webinar today on uh, identifying crafting narrative themes. I'm Shane, you'll hear from my colleague Olivia in just a second. So uh, before we even get into kind of the meat of what we're going to talk about today, uh, we wanna hear from you. So I'm going to launch a poll and just quickly, how prepared do you currently feel to apply narrative themes to your science communication? Just kind of want to get a check of where everyone's at. So I'll leave this up for about a minute. And for those of you who are just joining us, uh, just asking folks to fill out this poll real quick, just to kind of get a check of where everybody's at. All right, seems like things are leveling off. All right, let's see. Okay, so uh, a little bit of a bell curve kind of skewed towards less prepared than most prepared. And that is absolutely fine. That is what we're here for today to um, help you all, no matter what experience you have, what level you're at, to kind of think about narrative themes and storytelling more broadly. Uh, just a kind of housekeeping thing throughout. If you have questions, we're going to have a bunch of time at the end for questions in your little dashboard that should be is probably on the right side of your screen. There's a questions box. So as we're going along, uh, please type your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So briefly some background about us. If you've never taken a webinar before, uh, or you're not familiar with AGU, the American Geophysical Union, we're a big science society. Uh, we, we represent Earth and space scientists, a bunch of journals. Uh, we usually have a big annual conference um, that ranges between like somewhere in the 20,000 uh, attendees, even virtual, which was our one we had this past year, a bunch of smaller conferences as well. But within AGU is the Sharing Science Program, and that's us. Uh, and we we don't just kind of cater our resources to AGU members. It's it's a lot of this is for anyone who's interested. But our goal mission is to provide scientists with the skills, tools, opportunities, resources uh, that they that y'all need to share your science with really any audience. And we do this through a number of ways. Uh, we have workshops and webinars like this. We have a bunch of online resources. We have a really robust social media presence, a, a really great website that has a bunch of our stuff on it. We provide outreach opportunities and then even in some cases, uh, hands-on support, virtual or otherwise. This webinar is the second in a much larger storytelling series we're doing this year, and we're kind of adding to that as we go, but it's uh, part two of three in kind of this mini series we're doing on Storytelling 101. And so if you, um, if you missed the first one, not to worry, we're gonna do a quick recap of that. And then we also have a recording of it and an infographic and all sorts of stuff that we will uh, pass along after this so that you'll be able to catch up briefly about who is exactly talking to you. My name is Shane. I am an ecologist by training. I have a background in biology. I came to the science communication and storytelling world uh, through science policy. I wanted to know what happened to research. I got interested in what I do here at AGU, teaching scientists how to communicate more effectively. And really with storytelling, uh, not only through AGU, but outside of my the hat I wear here, I am also a storyteller here in the DC region where I am. I, I tell stories at different shows and for different organizations. And I'm also a senior producer with the science storytelling organization, The Story Collider. So lots of storytelling experience, lots of science experience and combining those two things. And I'll let Olivia introduce herself. Sure, thanks Shane. 
Uh, so yes, I'm Olivia Ambrogio, um, also a biologist by training. Got very excited about the sex labs and marine snails, which are still very exciting in case anyone is wondering. Always happy to talk more about that at another time. Uh, had a circuitous route into science communication uh, where I've been ever since and often still try in addition to facilitating others in doing SciComm as we are now to do stealth education of others by um, just you know showing up on the beach and letting people know about things like horseshoe crabs. It's, it's important that everyone should know about them. Um, from my perspective in terms of storytelling, I'm also a creative writer. Uh, so I have stories and poems and so on published in various anthologies and um, magazines and so forth. And so I have a passion for storytelling from, from that avenue of my life as well. Thanks, Olivia. So we're going to cover a bunch in this webinar, but if there's something that we didn't quite touch on or maybe a medium or a mode of storytelling you're interested in, please drop it in the, in the questions. Uh, like I said, even if we don't get to it, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can and then follow up with folks afterwards as well. So telling stories. Uh, so some, if not many of you are coming from our first webinar, which we really covered kind of the basics of storytelling, uh, but not everyone. So I want to either give folks a quick refresher or kind of a crash course in storytelling. Why tell stories? This might seem like a, a strange question, but we, we mean this not only kind of in the sciences, but more broadly. And the answer to this question is that we're telling stories all the time and we might not even realize it. Storytelling is a type of language. We've been telling stories for as long as we as, let's say hominids, have been communicating all of our history and, and so much has been passed down through stories. And especially in the sciences, we I feel like we oftentimes, especially in kind of Western culture, act like science storytelling is this newfangled thing that like we created and we came up with and, and we're amazing at it. And it is seeing a moment, let's say right now, especially within the sciences, but it's important for folks to realize, and it's important that we realize this as well, that there are many numerous cultures out there that their like, the primary way in which they communicate is through stories. And this line between science and storytelling isn't quite a line. The, the way in which science is presented and, and storytelling is used, it's just they're kind of one and the same. So I just want to be clear that we're talking about science storytelling in a way that you can use stories to prevent, or excuse me, present your science and to communicate science, but we are not the originators of this idea by any means. And, and we want to be um, mindful that there are, yeah, like folks and cultures out there who this is something that they they do all the time and, and this is not something new for, for many folks out there. Um, but like I said, like storytelling is a type of language for many. And there's also, this is science storytelling. We like that there's kind of a biological component behind it because storytelling affects the brain in very specific ways, or it can. So if I'm telling a story, say something like I was uh, running down the street one day and then I ended up tripping over the curb and busted my lip open. The same parts of my brain that I'm using to tell that story are the same parts of all of your brains out there that are being utilized to hear that story. So we are connecting on a neurological level. If I say action verbs like run, throw, kick, jump, skip, whatever it might be, the same parts of my brain that I'm using to say those words are the same parts of my brain that would then be activated if I actually do those actions. And when we're telling stories, like our brain can release dopamine because we get really excited and the adrenaline starts kicking in. And so there are neurological components to the power of storytelling, not just from the storyteller themselves, but as also on the part of the receiver. So we can, we can talk about uh, the power of storytelling in many different ways, but there is a biological component to it. And so I keep throwing around stories. Well, what's, what's a story? And this was the bulk of what we talked about in the last webinar. I said you can go uh, check it out and some of our, our highlights if you didn't get to see it but the kind of uh the download the tldr of the last the first webinar was we talked about story structure the basic outline the kind of bones of a story and the basic component of a story is a story arc 
this is the this is the basic structure so you start your story then something happens there's this kind of rising action where the um say the protagonist has adventures and encounters all sorts of obstacles that they need to overcome and then finally the climax the big payoff and then you have your falling action and your resolution uh all good stories adhere to this structure in some way within this kind of structure there's also these uh story arcs or kind of emotional arcs so how do you as an audience feel when you're hearing listening uh viewing reading about these stories and this is not comprehensive but these are some of the more popular ones and you might be able to think about some examples that you've come across and there are some here so you have the rags to riches uh the opposite of that is the riches to rags the icarus so this is the rise and then fall uh, the inverse of that is the man in the hole. So if something terrible happens in the very beginning and then they have to um, dig themselves out of it. And then uh, some of the, which is probably what most stories frankly fall into, kind of the up and down. And these take different um, different forms. You have the rise and the fall, then the rise, and then the opposite of that. This is not comprehensive by any means. There are so many different emotional arcs that stories can take, but these are some of the big ones to kind of just help you think about this uh think about not only story structure but some of these emotional arcs that stories can take so with that let's say sprint background we're going to get into what you all came here today and talk about narrative themes and before i hand things over to olivia uh i have uh another poll question for you so i'm going to launch this and really quick have you ever thought about narrative themes in when communicating your science or kind of in general. And so, yes or no, leave it open for a little bit and then we'll keep moving. All right, I'm gonna give folks a few more seconds. Oh, great, okay. So a uh, majority of you have, uh, I gotta be honest, before I started doing this type of work, I never really even contemplated narrative themes. So that's great. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to provide some more kind of fine detail. And for those of you who haven't, you're in luck as well, because that's what we're gonna talk about. So at uh this point i will hand things over to olivia thanks shane yeah so we're gonna go into a little bit about narrative themes and before i start talking about specific time kinds i just want to make a few notes one is one of the values of knowing about narrative themes and thinking about them in relation to how to talk about science is that you don't have to, in knowing them, it kind of helps you not have to reinvent the wheel. That's that's why this cartoon here, but I would try to put a car, far side cartoon in regardless because I think they're great. But the point being, because um, once we start thinking about narrative themes, we really know how they work. It can help even if you're you're feeling more apprehensive or uncertain or new to talking about science in a storytelling context to really have some sort of template for it. Also, as Shane is going to talk about more, the sort of idea of arcs and themes are really intertwined and they play off of one another. So it's not as if this is something entirely separate. This is just sort of another lens through which to look at the ways in which stories are told. And finally, uh, no narrative theme is an island. I'm going to be talking about these discreetly and giving examples in each category. But as you'll notice as I'm going through a lot of the more uh, familiar um, popular examples, and perhaps even some of the science examples, you'll realize that any number of them could probably fit into more than one theme. And that's fine. That's that's really typical because many of them can and do, but it just helps as you start to think about what kind of story you're telling. If one theme comes to the fore, that can be really useful. So with that, I'm going to talk a bit more about narrative themes, and I'll come I'll come back to uh, at least one of these in a bit. But there there are a lot of ways in which I'll say that you can see narrative themes. I'm going to talk about them first through sort of broader 
popular culture, and then as relates to science in particular. One very uh, archetypal narrative theme is the quest or the journey. So we see this everywhere from epics, um, like the Odyssey, to movies like Thelma and Louise, or books and movies like Ready Player One. You can also see that one slotting pretty easily into science because so much of field work or hurricane chasing uh, very naturally falls into that because people do actually have to go somewhere, sometimes putting themselves in danger or facing risks or at least novelty. But these can also be quests for knowledge. They don't have to be physical acts of, of trekking somewhere in order for it to fit into this theme. In fact, we had someone at one of our workshops um, who is a computer modeler at NOAA, who said, you know what, all of my work is really a lot like Ready Player One. We're in this virtual world creating new worlds that can answer these questions. Uh, anyway, I thought that was pretty a pretty cool way to look at it. So some examples within science storytelling of the use of the sort of journey or quest theme. Um, Chasing Ice, which is a documentary that we talked about a bit during the last webinar, follows the photographer uh, James Baylog, who was on this quest to document glaciers and their um, receding over time. So it was about both this change in nature, in the environment, and about the quest of this individual. Um, but you can also talk about quests related to the science itself or to the habitat, so where the water goes, we have this takes readers on an adventure down river. So the movement of the water itself also, also serves as a sort of movement for the narrative. Similarly, Rachel Carson, who is perhaps best known now for her work Silent Spring, where she talked about the dangerous uh, cascading ecological consequences of DDT use, she actually became well known as a writer because of her books about the ocean. And I really recommend that you read them. They're fantastic. My favorite is, of course, The Edge of the Sea, because it's about intertidal creatures, and they have a special place in my heart. But in Under the Sea Wind, what she does that's really fantastic is she tells sort of a, a, a story about different um, habitats and species by following different ones. So in a couple of cases, she even names one like Rinkops which is the genus name for a black skimmer. She sort of gives uh, an individual a name, quote unquote. And it's not really anthropomorphized, but she follows first this black skimmer and then a heron and then some fish and then follows them, you know, as they're young through growing through their migration to the sea and then back inland or into uh, other waters. So she takes us on this journey where we learn about different species and habitats through the travel from one species to another, as well as their own migrations. Uh, on trails, too, Robert Moore's fantastic book that is both a history of trails, so it's sort of a journey through time and trail making in different species, and also a physical journey as he talks about his own travels on different trails. Similarly, uh, and more broadly, you know, any kind of science that relates to say space exploration or deep sea exploration or research cruises, these are all, they lend themselves very easily to that narrative theme of the quest or the journey. Okay, the mystery. Everybody always loves a good mystery. Um, these are slightly outdated examples, I guess, but you know, they, more keep coming up all the time. And a, so much of science is about solving mysteries. Why are these coral reefs bleaching? What's causing these extinctions? What can we learn from ice cores? So a lot of um, science stories fall into this sort of mystery category. The ghost map, um, whose cover I showed earlier, is essentially a mystery about how um, a, a doctor and a couple of other people in London helped solve the mystery of the cholera epidemic of what was causing it by, by um, testing hypotheses and figuring things out in uh, 19th century London. Um, many things related to forensics or to 
uh, medical diagnoses, so the Poisoner's Handbook around forensics and Oliver Sacks with medical diagnoses, many of those are about mysteries, right? Things like, was someone you know, poisoned deliberately or not? How was it? How did it happen? Who did it? All of that stuff. Um, similarly with diagnoses, what is actually causing these symptoms? How do we find this out? What is the culprit? In the Periodic Table by Primo Levi, a um, well-known Italian writer, uh, he has a number of different kinds of stories in this collection, but he was also a chemist, an industrial chemist, and several of his stories actually focus on things like mysteries. And I want to emphasize with this that in order to be compelling, science stories don't have to be life or death. They don't have to be about who poisoned someone or what's causing an epidemic. Uh, one of the most entertaining stories in this collection is about him figuring out why um, paint at this particular factory wasn't drying properly. So there are a lot of different ways in which mysteries can be used, regardless of whether you have a life or death situation, to draw people in. Another narrative theme that we don't, I think, think about as much, but we sort of automatically recognize when it comes up is this idea of a stranger comes to town and nothing is the same again. It happens in a lot of Westerns, a lot of horror movies, um, where this, this kind of situation occurs. Similarly, you could use this kind of theme to talk about situations like natural hazards, ocean acidification, invasive species. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Shane for a little bit to talk about a really great example of the stranger comes to town theme from the science world. Thanks, Olivia. So I mentioned up top that I'm an ecologist by training, and I'm a I'm trained as a herpetologist. I studied amphibians and reptiles, specifically disease ecology within that world. And I I, I know a researcher who tells this story often about. Uh, so they were studying this tree frog population in Central America for years and years and years, uh, and it was just kind of a, a long-term population study just for, um, just to really track them or to track these frogs. And noticed one day that some of the frogs turned up dead and uh, not many, maybe like a half dozen or so, but just dead in a way that they would never seen before. I just couldn't really explain it. But also there weren't a ton of them, so didn't really think anything of it. Sent the frogs off to be tested, uh, to to kind of do um, necropsies, uh, basically try to figure out the cause of death. And then they went home for the field season. Came back the following year and to the same spot. And where, and where there used to be hundreds, if not thousands of frogs, there were zero, like literally zero, not a single one. And so, they had no idea what was going on there and, and never, like the, the, the frogs just didn't come back. So they moved on to a new site uh, and there were frogs and it was great, but then it started to occur to them that the frogs were one, just kind of acting a little weird, just a little different, uh, but two, they started dying as well and in much larger numbers. And, and they had these characteristics that they had never really seen before. They were dying from something that they just had no idea what it was. And it wasn't just happening here in Central America. More and more cases started popping up kind of all around. And what they determined after the kind of results came back from the lab is that it was a fungus, uh, a fungus called Betractochytrium dendrobatidis. We refer to it as BD, and it's a chytrid fungus that um, is essentially responsible for wiping out so many frog populations, uh, and, and it, it's terrible. It, it, it basically, it digs into the skin of frogs, and uh, frogs breathe in some effect through their skin, and it prevents it them from doing that, and they essentially like suffocate and go to cardiac arrest. It's this really terrible, awful disease. And what they found was that this disease started spreading, especially through Central America uh, in the late 80s and through the mid 2000s and just wiped out all of these populations. And now it's all around the world. It's on every single continent where amphibians exist. And so the fungus 
I was gonna say was, is the stranger. Like it is the thing that so often has come into frog specifically populations and just changed everything forever. And as someone who researched this, I really never thought of this until I started doing this work in science communication. And now I just, it, it's, a, it's a terrible example from a conservation standpoint, uh, but I think it's a great example when thinking about how to tell a compelling story about a specific area of science through storytelling, specifically through uh, a type of narrative theme. And so that's not a super uplifting story, but I'll give it back to Olivia to talk about, uh, it's not always bad. So we don't wanna kind of leave that taste in your mouth. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. Gosh, that is, oh, it's just so awful. I feel so bad for those frogs. Um, but yeah, so the, the idea of a stranger comes to town, I just want to emphasize, it doesn't always have to be a bad stranger. A lot of the examples we gave from the one that Shane so vividly described to things like, you know, ocean acidification, climate change, those are all bad, no argument. But when you're thinking about this, the stranger arriving, it doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Discoveries are strangers coming to town in many ways. And if the story is about the impact that these discoveries have made, have had for good, then that's a good stranger. Um, so sanitation, you know, way to go. Yes, high five, excellent stranger. Thank you for coming to town. Uh, longitude, discoveries of how to measure and navigate more accurately. Also really great for a lot of people. Uh, books like The Invention of Nature, where um, individuals are, or a whole group of people changing their approach to, to how they look at the world. So thinking about nature, thinking about the environment, think, thinking about the field of ecology and how that transforms how we behave and how we perceive the world. Those are also Stranger Comes to Town stories and they're, they're good ones or rather I should say happier ones. The others are good stories too. Another uh, really compelling narrative theme is the coming of age or rite of passage story. And this is about sometimes a kid, especially if it's coming of age, but really anyone at any time point coming into their own in some way, sort of finding the meaning for their lives or, or taking on agency where they didn't have it. The, or finding their place. These are really great from a scientific perspective because pretty much everyone who is in science can tell a story of how they became a scientist or how they became a science communicator, whatever kind of position you're in. So um, Uncle Tungsten, for example, Memoirs of a Chemical Boyhood, it's about Oliver Sacks' enthusiasm and how he became excited about and learned about chemistry. Rocket Boys, too, about kids who learn about um, astronomy, you know, sort of coming into their own as scientists. But you can also talk about that from the perspective of the science itself. So Jane Goodall's In the Shadow of Man, in part, sure, you could say it's a um, coming of age or rite of passage story about a young scientist, you know, becoming this preeminent um, primate researcher. But you can also see it as a story about how Goodall's um, groundbreaking approach to, to looking at other, other animal species as having individuality transformed the entire field of animal behavior. So it also had a coming of age. Similarly with the Poisoner's Handbook, which as I mentioned also has some mystery themes, you can see too it's even described as um, sort of the birth of forensic medicine. So it's how this whole field kind of came into being and, and came into its own. So there are stories that you can tell both about yourself coming into your own in science or about some aspect of science that you want to share that has arrived sort of where it is because of various trials and tribulations and new knowledge. Another one that we don't talk about enough uh, with science, but we really should, is the love story. Obviously, these are always popular. Um, I've focused on romantic love here, but that doesn't have to be exclusively the case. Um, and some of you may already be familiar with the term the meet cute, which refers to the moment when two characters, again, often romantically, but not exclusively, first meet up. And um, 
this can often be a situation where there's initially some um, hostility towards one another, a disagreement of some kind. It doesn't have to be, but it's sort of a, that memorable moment. So you could think of a similar thing. Do you have your meet cute around science or the science that you engage with or that you currently do? So there are some great examples in science, and I'm going to start um, with Middlemarch because George Eliot says this, this really well in the novel Middlemarch. Most of us who turn to any subject we love remember some morning or evening hour when we got on a high stool to reach down an untried volume or sat with parted lips listening to a new talker or for very lack of books began to listen to the voices within as the first traceable beginnings of our love. And then she describes how one of her um, main characters, Tertius Lydgate, this doctor, um, decided to become a doctor and how he sort of fell in love. He looks into an old encyclopedia and sees the valves of the heart. And he's just completely absorbed as a kid. And before he got down from his chair, the world was made new to him by a presentiment of endless processes filling the vast spaces planked out of his sight by that wordy ignorance which he had supposed to be knowledge. From that hour, Lydgate felt the growth of an intellectual passion. Now, I'm going to give some other examples in a moment, but I do want to just um, mention that a lot of the, the books that we're referring to, Shane and I, are the examples have to do with sort of either science documentaries or books about science that may have been popularized and so on. But you can learn about storytelling from anything. You can learn about it from literature. You can learn about it from commercials. You can learn about it from movies. You can learn about it from anything, any medium that is using storytelling. You can pick up and make use of what you find compelling in it. So do keep that in mind. So some other examples in science. Um, again, Rachel Carson, really great at this in her book, The Sense of Wonder. She talks about how one can help to instill this this uh, sense of wonder, how, how one can sort of help children fall in love with and stay in love with the natural world. Uh, Oliver Sacks in Oaxaca Journal, it's sort of semi, a semi-travelogue, but it's also about this person whose whole job was around um, studying neurological disorders. He also had a passion for ferns, which is just, it just makes me so happy. Anyway, you can you can feel the love of it throughout, suffused through this book that also includes a lot of science about them. The animal dialogues too, this mixture of um, zoological information and this kind of passion for the encounters that one has with the natural world. Oh, you can also have though, you can fall out of love, right? Those are stories too. Or you can have unrequited love. Um, another great example from Oliver Sacks in his memoir On the Move, he talks about well, he, he, it sort of was brought home to him that much as he might have liked lab research, it did not like him. So he describes a series of mishaps, including having taken his lab notebook home and then trying to get back to the lab. I failed to secure the elastic bands on the bike rack of his motorcycle. And my precious notebook containing nine months of detailed experimental data escaped from the loose strands and flew off the bike while I was on the Cross Bronx Expressway. Pulling over to the side, I saw the notebook, notebook dismembered page by page by the thunderous traffic. Um, he also has some trouble in the lab, gets crumbs on the lab bench, and after 10 months of work, loses the myelin that he had spent all of that time extracting. So, you know, sad and happy, but a bit of an unrequited love story there. So these are just a few of the kinds of uh, narrative themes that you can see science fitting into, I hope, fairly well. And with that, Shane's going to talk a little bit more about how um, themes and arcs are really interconnected. Thanks, Olivia. And yeah, I really, I really love those examples Olivia brought up. And I'm just going to kind of reiterate her point that we're throwing a lot of examples at you that are literary works, um, sometimes, oftentimes professional writers. But I really, I, I, 
it really hits home with me that idea that stories are everywhere and you don't need to be a professional writer or a professional storyteller to tell a really good story. Many of us are telling really great stories and we might not even realize it. And so for some of you, this might be uh, an exercise in I'm already doing this thing and now I realize the actual kind of the, the components and theory behind it to kind of try and make those stories better. So again, just wanted to kind of reiterate that. And I feel like that kind of goes hand in hand with this idea that themes and arcs go hand in hand. So we uh, we showed you this at the beginning. Uh, this is uh, this is from a study that took oh I want to say thousands of works of um, primarily fiction, a fiction and nonfiction, and identified these emotional arcs within them and really came out with these six big ones. These are not the only ones, but these are some of the of the big ones. And this is essentially, like I said before, kind of how you as the audience feel taking in these stories. And just to map this out, emotional arcs are, uh, are an aspect of kind of the structure of a story. So a lot of the emotion happens in the structural rising action of a story. So not all of it, but a lot of this is taking place within a, a component of what the structure of a story looks like. So you have your basic story arc, which is the, the green uh, animated one or illustrated one here that Olivia drew. You have within that these emotional arcs, but then another part of this all is narrative themes and they are not, they're not an or, they're an and. And there's actually some work out there identifying and, and mapping arcs to themes and so in this work uh they the authors they named their narrative themes a little bit different so you have the discovery the rescue the mystery uh but then they also identified different uh different arcs different emotional arcs to them and you could see like some of these look familiar so for the rescue for example you have the man in the hole and i want to uh I want to put out there that you can map arcs to narrative themes, vice versa, but much like you might have a story that has many different narrative themes, the way in which an emotional arc corresponds with a narrative theme, there might be multiple versions of those as well. So for example, uh, kind of the way that, that I at least personally like to think of some of these. So for the mystery, the, the way I think of a narrative, or excuse me, an, an emotional arc for a mystery is kind of this man in the whole one, that you start out at a certain point and then immediately like something happens, um, say someone is murdered. And then the entire time of the story, you're spent trying to get out of this and the resolution might be at a higher point than where you started, but it also is just as likely that it might just be, you just might be back to status quo because you figured it out, but then someone is still dead. Um, going backwards, the way they identified it here with their mystery, they had this bump before you kind of get into this this uh, this trough and then ultimately this resolution. And that's okay. It's just going to show that you will identify narrative arcs, or excuse me, narrative themes and emotional arcs and how they correspond maybe a little bit differently. With A Stranger Comes to Town, that's kind of how I like to think of the one that they identified for the mystery. So things are going along uh, and and everyone might be, say, enjoying themselves and and um, and things are all, I don't know, like say hunky-dory or whatever, but then something happens. Then the, the stranger comes in and changes everything. And that's when you have the trough, you have that low point, and then maybe the resolution is just kind of back to the status quo, or maybe it is uh, kind of an even better resolution in the long term than you might have expected. Something like the rite of passage, right? Uh, this is, it could be kind of the rags to riches. That's, that's a really classic uh, rite of passage story. But even within this seemingly linear arc, you might have a lot of conflict. There might be a bunch of peaks and troughs, a lot of ups and downs within this story, and that's okay too. Same with the quest. I mean, you could argue that you could switch the arcs here, that a rite of passage might have this peak, then this trough, then the peak again, or vice versa. And um, and that would work as well. It's uh, it's But there are, ways to map arcs to themes. 
And then with the love story, I mean, you could have, I don't know, like tons of different highs and lows with, a, with any love story, uh, but you still have those rough structure. So kind of trying to pull all this together, you have the basic story structure, which is uh, the story arc. You have these emotional arcs that are that can be a component within that story arc. And then these narrative themes, which are these larger ways in which we think about stories, but all of this stuff is connected and connected in a multitude of ways, which is really great because you're not kind of, um, you're not hemmed into a corner. You're, you don't have just like one option. There are so many different options in the ways that you can construct a story. And narrative themes and narrative in general can be incredibly powerful. Now, this is just a, a small sampling of the work out there examining uh, narrative and storytelling, but there has been work showing that narratives can increase the likelihood of remembering information. If you want your audience to really remember what you're talking about, craft a narrative, use these narrative themes. It can reduce people counter arguing with you because you're telling a really compelling story in a way that's a little bit different maybe than the way they're used to communicating or hearing or receiving a message. We're going to cover transportation a lot in our final one, our final webinar of this mini series when we talk about the kind of the personal aspect of things. But a narrative can transport people into the storyteller's shoes. You're in the moment with the storyteller, uh, whether that's like literally in a scene with them or in their mind, whatever it might be. There's a way to transport people into their shoes. And this is kind of why we want to tell stories, especially within the sciences anyways. But it, there's evidence that shows that it can be more convincing than just throwing them data alone or just kind of uh, throwing information at them. This idea of the deficit model that people have a deficit of information. They just don't have enough information. And if we provide them the information, everything will be solved. And that just, it just doesn't work that way. But storytelling can be a helpful way to kind of get around that. And can, it can increase uh, non-expert audience engagement as audience engagement as well. And so again, like I said, this is a small sampling of the work that's out there, but there's much, much evidence about the power of narrative and narrative themes. And I just want to end with this as our, our last example before we wrap up and, and get to Q&A. But I think this study is fascinating. So uh, I'm so I'm from rural Pennsylvania originally and, and now in the D.C. region, but I'm from Appalachia. I am from coal country. And it turns out that there's a lot of stories out there, fiction and nonfiction, about coal and about oil and about uh like the, and it takes all sorts of different forms but this study examined a whole bunch of different uh different st stories excuse me fiction and nonfiction about coal and oil and i pulled this quote out this is directly from the abstract but uh at least kind of in these uh, in american stories and, and what we have uh, here Oil is depicted as new and exciting, and it's associated with danger, right? Like an oil well, uh, I can just have images from movies or, or shows where like the oil well burst and there's literally oil spurting out of the ground. And they, the workers have to cap it and there could be danger with that. But it's, uh, it's, it's could be seen as, as like tragic, but also very, very thrilling. There's a reason why it's called oil exploration. Like that's a type of storytelling. That is a way in which talking about oil that uh, could be more, let's say, palatable or interesting. Coal, by contrast, is portrayed nostalgically. So lots of feelings of community and home and the way I grew up and that type of thing and family, but also in a way that's betrayed its communities and it no longer represents security and prosperity. And so oil is hypothetical and exciting. Uh, coal is real and disappointing. And uh, on the right here, they mapped these different stories to emotional arcs, right? The rise and the fall, the fall and the rise, the fall, the rise. So this is happening in, in stories about, in this case, fossil fuels. And Olivia and I were actually talking about this uh, the other day, and this is really interesting. For example, maybe if you're using stories to talk to stakeholders or policymakers, something like saying oil exploration instills these ideas of adventure it's it's like this is really exciting we're going to do oil exploration and that's kind of the narrative that you've probably heard around 
drilling in uh, in Alaska and some of the national parks and places that have been off limits for decades. But they talk about oil exploration, like it's this journey, it's this quest to find something. Coal is never talked about that way. Coal is talked about as it's coal mining. And so this, the way in which we talk about these things is very different. And that might that may or may not be a deliberate choice sometimes, but nonetheless, it does affect, independent of the, the ecological consequences, which there are many and they are dire, it does change the way in which we um, maybe not necessarily identify with these issues, but uh, the way in which we feel about them. So yeah, I, I, I think the study is fascinating. All of these studies uh, and our follow-up will kind of give you a, a mini bibliography if you're interested in dive, diving into this stuff on your own. So that's uh, that's our presentation. Uh, we're gonna do Q and A in a second, but before we do, one last question for you, last one, I promise. Uh, after you spent these past 47 minutes with us, we wanna see where you're at now. Uh, so how prepared do you currently feel to apply narrative themes to science communication? All right, I'll give folks about 10 more seconds. And just as uh, we're finishing up here, Olivia has been answering some of your questions in the chat. Uh, all of these webinars are archived, so we're going to send a follow-up email probably next week, and it'll have where this recording is, some additional information, all of our other webinars, so we'll be able to provide you with all of that. Okay, look at, wow, zero least prepared. That makes me feel good. Well, this is really great. I'm, I'm happy to see that in a short time together, we're able to kind of uh, move the needle with all of you. But uh, but this isn't the end. Uh, so first things first, we are two down in our mini series of three, but we're going to start scheduling kind of our next mini series of storytelling webinars, which is really going to focus on sci art and multimedia. So how do you tell stories via comics and illustrations? How do you tell stories via audio? So for example, podcasting. And how do you tell stories with film? And so we have some in-house experience with this, but we're also going to be pulling in some folks who know a lot about this. So if you are, um, like stay tuned for this, if you will get a follow-up email once we get these things scheduled. If you're interested in that, we hope that you'll attend. Uh, we are on all the social medias. This isn't just a plug to get followers. We share all of this stuff through social media. Uh, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, especially trying to get the word out. So if you are interested in these things, if you're not following us already, this is not just a shameless plug. You will get a lot of information from it. If you are interested in this type of thing and you want to be part of a community of folks who are also interested in this, Join the sharing science community. You don't have to be an AGU member. Heck, you don't even have to be a scientist. We have discussion boards, we have resources, we have toolkits, we have threads, we have all sorts of stuff. Uh, a lot of the manuscripts that you've seen here, we have as well. It's a quick form, you can fill it out, you'll be part of the community. I mentioned podcasts. AGU has two podcasts. Uh, one that's been around for a while and one we're just starting. And this is Scientel and Third Pod from the Sun. But they're different uh, in, in the content, but the, the idea around storytelling is the same. So if you're interested in hearing, one, how we pull stories out of people, uh, both of these are interview-based, but two, just some really compelling science stories and the way that we can craft stories and some examples from folks who are not professional, uh, or, or excuse me, journalists or writers or anything like that, uh, we encourage you just to take a listen. And the last thing I'll land on, and then we'll get to questions, is that we love our webinar series because anyone can be on this. I'm sure we have people from all around the world on this right now. Um, and we can answer questions and that's great too, but we can't really dive deep into things. We can't do kind of that one-on-one -on -one personal interaction. So if you, or you think your university or institution or whatever it might be, might be interested in a workshop where there's a lot more hands-on activity. We are doing these virtual now uh, for the foreseeable future. We cover a whole slew of different things. So if you're interested in that, please consider requesting a workshop. 
And with that, um, I will actually go back to this slide about our social media and we'll take some questions. Yeah, we have a bunch of great questions. Um, I'm very excited to have them um, and to start addressing them. And Shane, I hope you're going to come on camera too, yeah, so yeah, I I'm don't feel there. alone here. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, so one very quickly that I just want to touch up. Well, no, if you don't mind, Shane, I'm going to jump in to start with because I've been looking Go at ahead. a few of these. Um, so we had a couple of questions related to stories in terms of examples, both from different um, media like uh, newspaper articles, radio and news headlines, Twitter ads, and so on. And also just the, the idea in a couple of cases of length, because a lot of the examples we've given have been full uh, scale movies or um, novels or, or long books, that kind of thing. But absolutely, stories can be very short. Um, as Shane was talking about with our series, we're gonna be talking more about uh, different multimedia versions of stories and also to some degree, shorter uh, length stories in these upcoming webinars. But yeah, length does not, it can determine certain things about how much you can put into a story, but it doesn't determine the power of the story. There's no kind of direct correlation between the length of a story and how powerful it is. Um, and just again, to give an example, I mentioned commercials because, you know, people who work on them have to be good at emotional manipulation. Otherwise, you would never remember their product. That said, I don't pay, I don't watch commercials because I get mad at them typically. And when I do watch them, I sometimes remember the story, but not the product. So I'm the wrong audience for most of these. However, let me give you one example of a one minute ad. It was for a car. I've already forgotten again which kind it was. Um, but it was this, it was this one minute story. This older woman, uh, she's clearly just lost her husband. She and he were both immigrants. Um, from I think Ireland or something. He left her a note saying, you know, I've, I've had a wonderful adventure with you, but we never got to to travel this this country that we came to. I hope you can do it without me. So it's this whole story that taps into this American narrative, US narrative of the road trip, where the whole family, the, the grandmother, the parents, the kids all get in this car together and they drive across the country and they see the majesty that the you know, country has to offer. And through all of this, they're telling stories to each other. They're learning how the grandmother and grandfather got to know each other. You know, they're laughing together. They're becoming more of a family so that when they get to the West Coast and scatter his ashes, the grandmother, you know, is sad, but she can go on now, you know, and they've, they've built something stronger together. And again, that was one minute and it was for some sort of car. So length and um, medium do not determine whether or not you can tell a story. I, uh, I'm just catching up on questions now. And uh, there's a question about um, objectivity in science and credibility in science. And I'm paraphrasing, but essentially do does communicating in using uh, in a way that might elicit emotional response, uh, have your audience feel kind of these emotional arcs, does that threaten credibility? Does that reduce our credibility? Um, and the short, I can't say for everyone, right? Like I, I one person, but the short answer is no. The answer is no. Um, Cause there is actually evidence out there, increasing evidence uh, that we actually we didn't throw on here cause there's only so much we can do. But when you next humanize, one. yeah, next one, yeah, it's true. We're gonna talk about the personal part of it. But when you humanize science and humanize scientists and show audiences that scientists are real people that they are just like them, except they happen to do some like awesome work, people will trust in science more. They will trust in scientists. They will identify with them and they will trust in institutions. Like we see this out there. So for the most part, uh, if we're talking about kind of majorities, it's a myth that if you inject the personal into the science, that all of a sudden you are not credible. There's a balance. There is always a balance. And so I just want to be clear on that. Like I'm not, we are not advocating for, I don't exactly know, just like wearing your heart in your sleeve or whatever it might be and not putting the science in there, of course, but finding the balance between that this is my science and this is why I care about it. 
people will identify with you, they will empathize with you, they will relate to you, and then they will receive your message in a way um, well, they will be more receptive to your message essentially. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of a long-winded way of saying that no, it doesn't reduce credibility. If anything, it actually increases it for many audiences. Yeah, and I, I just wanna get one question, sort of the other side of that coin to some degree. I really like this. Are scientific stories different in terms of theme arc, et cetera, from false ones? Or do creationism, climate denial, COVID is a hoax, et cetera, just tell alternative stories, but in similar ways? This is such a great question. Um, and I don't think there is one single answer, because I think partly it depends on what kind of stories people are telling, right? Misinformation campaigns have a lot of different elements to it. So there can be storytelling elements that can be very powerful, especially anecdotes about things like, you know, um, uh, you know, if you talk about vaccine situations, especially, and you tell some story about, you know, a child who got vaccinated and then got horribly ill, you're you're telling a story potentially in the typical structure of storytelling that may still be false in terms of the message that you're you're coming out of it with the interpretation that you're making other times i think people or you know whole uh systems who have who have been building on this misinformation have built these narrative themes just like what shane was talking about with oil and um cool if you can either create this whole narrative or tap into one that's sort of existing in our consciousness because of other stories we've been told, then I think it's much, it, it, it adds that much more power if you're tapping into the stories. Shane, do you have anything to add there? No, no, I, I think that's perfect. Um, yeah, I, I think that's great. Uh, one I saw, and this is funny, because I actually made a note about this, so y'all are reading my mind, but, uh, someone said, for each of these story types, I recognize the story I want to tell in my research as well. How do I choose? That is a great problem to have. Uh, that is a fantastic problem to have. And it's the the short answer is that you need to, and I don't mean this to sound hokey, but you need to be authentic yourself, right? You need to think about which one of these I like relates to what I'm doing most. Which one of these do I identify with the most? But part of that might depend on who are you telling the story for. Storytelling is is a a facet of communication, at least at least in the context in which we are talking about it, uh, coming from this more technical aspect of it. And any sort of communication, the first thing is like, if you can think about who you're talking to, and that will dictate how you communicate to them. So that might also influence what type of narrative theme your story can take. Um, because if it's a more, if you're talking to a more kind of technical audience, then maybe, maybe going like hard in on rite of passage might not be for them. Maybe something like, uh, like the mystery or the stranger comes to town where the focus is more on your science, still injecting the personal, but more about the science that might be more appropriate. Whereas if you're meeting with a policymaker and asking them to increase funding for some uh, some initiative or whatever else, get personal because that's what really tugs on the heartstrings. So you probably can't go wrong if you're already at that stage, but you can use who you're talking to to help think about the way and with like the direction your story takes. Yeah, and I would say too, I had made a note earlier that I wanted to mention this, the sort of theme that the that the story fits under most is going to depend, and the emotional arc that it, the shape that it has is going to really depend on where you end your story, well, and where you begin it. So, for example, um, a mystery around a particular area of scientific research could be the you know we don't know what this is. We needed to figure out. We tried these things. We went up. We you know overcame these various obstacles. We found it out, and now we understand this thing. But if you start that story after you've, you've made that discovery, let's say, you've determined that thing, and then what you're doing with it, that could potentially be a stranger comes to town narrative because you're, you're picking up at a different point. And even if you're a, a far way along from whatever determination you made, discovery you made, that still doesn't mean that you can't tell the story just about that mystery part. So someone was saying, um, these are all very broad scale examples. Can you give us an example of smaller scale research results for narratives? One, again, the personal stories are always going to be relevant, regardless of what you're studying. You know, was something 
frustrating? Was something hard? Did you have to overcome something? And you can tell a small personal story, even if it doesn't encompass the entirety of the science that you want to talk about. But again, a lot of science, even for smaller scale research, can fit especially into the mystery narrative. You know, here we are doing this, and we need to figure this out. And it's okay if in your story, you haven't solved everything. So long as you've, you've told a bit of that story and gotten people engaged and included elements of personal interest, which we'll talk more about um, next month, it's still going to captivate people. Yeah, I, and there are, so we're now over time, uh, but there are so many great questions, some we didn't get to. And so, uh, like I said, we're going to follow up with everyone, send out an email with a bunch of information, and we will uh, try to address uh, the questions we didn't get to, at least be able to point folks to different resources if we don't address the questions uh, directly. And then some of these as well will be, we've either kind of talked about them in the ARC, uh, the, the first webinar, or we'll talk about them again in the next one. And as always, you can please feel free to like reach out to us or add us on Twitter or whatever. Uh, some of our favorite parts of what we do is actually interacting with people, uh, even if it is the virtual environment. Like Olivia and I haven't actually seen each other in person for a year, but we still very much enjoy doing this. So with that, thank you all very much for joining us today. And we hope to uh, see you or at least see your name and hear a question from you at a future webinar. Bye everyone. Yeah.